Welcome to our podcast series, Talking with Traders, hosted by expert trader Garth McKenzie in London, from where he's interviewing various guests on the topic of trading. Welcome back to Talking with Traders. This is the fifth season of the podcast to take us up to the end of 2022. Thanks to all our loyal listeners for returning and welcome to all our new listeners. As before, IG Markets have come on board as sponsors of this podcast. We're truly grateful to have such an award-winning CFD provider as sponsor alongside us. In this season, I'll welcome back some guests from the previous seasons of the podcast to get their updated market views, and we'll also be bringing in some new guests to the microphone too. As always, the aim with these podcasts is to give you the opportunity to listen to differing market views and to assist you with your own trading and investing education. So with that in mind, let's get straight into another episode of Talking with Traders. Welcome back to another episode of Talking with Traders. Uh, and it's my privilege once again to welcome back Anthony Clark from Small Talk Daily Research. It's the third time that he is appearing on this podcast. And um, Anthony, as I've said to a couple of the other guests that have come back repeatedly, you know, we only invite the really insightful guys back, the ones that have made such a good impression in the past. So coming back for the third time, um, it, it's, a, it's always a pleasure to speak to you and welcome back to the podcast. Well, hi, Garth. It's uh, very nice to be back, and thank you for your kind words. And I can tell your listeners, I didn't give I didn't give Garth a cent, or should I say, even a pound, to say that. <laughs> yeah, no, it, you need no introduction. I mean, your your work is always incredibly insightful, and um, and I know that you're a, a popular a popular man when it comes to TV and podcasts and radio and all of that sort of thing. So I count myself lucky that at least you give me an hour or so of your time. It's very much appreciated, Anthony. Um. Let's get straight into it. You're obviously you're well known in South Africa. You're a, a highly ranked uh, analyst in the small and mid cap space, so need no introduction really in that respect. When we spoke last year, and it was almost a year ago that we spoke, um, you, we we made you made the convers the, the comment at that point that you know there had been a fair amount of re rating upwards in the small and mid cap sector of the JSE and that the value that had been lying around there 2 years ago was was not as clearly evident anymore as as it was say in early 2020 um but yet it was still a stock picker's market and that there was money to be made in in, in select stocks and i pressed you for a a possible pick, if you like, uh, as one that could re-rate quite a lot. And you picked Grinrod. And Grinrod is up 100% since then. So, well done. <laughs> it's it's a tough act to follow. And I'm going to ask you again in this interview to see what you know what you'll pick for the year ahead. But we'll do that a little, little later. Where are you standing on Grinrod now? Because last time you, you picked it on the basis that Transnet was such a mess and that there was likely to be some sort of a public-private partnership happening, which Grinrod would be a part of in terms of logistics and transportation in South Africa. Where are you standing on Grinrod at this point in time? Yeah, I'm looking at Grinrod right now on my screen. It's down uh, to 9 Rand 40. It has been as high as, as 11.50. Mm. Uh, but as you know, you know, with, the, with domestic and global geopolitics and, of course, the Ukrainian war uh, hitting uh, many uh, in the uh, in the markets for the last few months, it's done incredibly well, despite the fact uh, you know it's uh, it's off its best. Now the reason I chose Grimrod uh, was quite simple. Uh, it was November 2020, and I'd covered the stock for the best part of 20 years, and it was clearly uh, 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 looking to me at the stock that the counter at that point was trading at three rand seventy. The net asset value was north of twelve, um, and as you correctly mentioned, uh, the Underlying transportation, rail, and port network in this country, quite frankly, has been falling apart for years. And at some point, um, something would have to give uh, regarding getting the product from the mine or the field to the port for export, because this country needs the money. And Grindrod is one of the very few companies listed which actually has expertise in managing ports and rail and logistics. And the market just didn't care. Uh, they just saw this rag bag of businesses uh, we, on a huge discount to NAV, but it didn't quite understand the story. And I remember going in to see a very large client of mine, and they basically listened to an hour politely and just brushed me aside. And I kept on persisting, and it went from three rand seventy to four fifty to five fifty to seven fifty to ten rand and to eleven fifty. 
as the underlying nature of what was going on in this country started to actually transpire into what I would call achievables, where the government wants to bring in public-private partnership to try and pick up the pieces from a crumbling transnet infrastructure network in rail and in ports. And despite the fact that Grinrod is off its best, uh, it's still a stock that has done fantastically well. Um, many of the bad parts of Grinrod have been disposed of, including the, uh, the banking business, which went for double what the market thought it would go, with the African bank paying 1.5 billion rand. Yeah. Once that bank deal has been settled, uh, they will start uh, wiping out debt and then reshaping this company to become uh, a ports and logistics business for the next decade. And I think it's extremely well placed. Um, I had a target of 1150. It made that. I would not be surprised if in the next upwave, when actual contracts start to be awarded, which is probably at least two years away, my ultimate target will be 14 rand. So it's still a stock that I am uh, very close to, very fond of, and I would not be selling it in these indifferent markets. Okay. All right. Fantastic summary there. Thanks very much, Anthony. And uh, and yeah, as I just said, I mean, 100% up from the last time you picked it. So <laughs> very well done on that. Um, Renogen is a very popular stock in the retail universe. As we know, um, you referred to it last year as you know, one of the easy equities favorites. It's, it's very popular amongst the retail investing universe in South Africa. Um, and I think you've almost got a I don't want to say a monopoly, but nearly a monopoly on the, that space in terms of being the analyst, the go-to analyst that everybody looks to in terms of analysis on, on Renogen. Um, but last time we spoke about it, the stock had run very hard into, into October of 2021. It's gone sideways since then. And you did make the very valid point at that stage that nothing goes up in a straight line forever. These things do re-rate, then they tend to stabilize for a while and and eventually you know maybe it, it, you have a consolidation in time before things catch up again and perhaps you see another leg to the upside the big catalyst that we talked about last year for renogen was you, you mentioned that you were waiting on a revised update on the reserves and resources in the ground for the company uh, where are we on that now has that been published and can you maybe give us a bit of an update on your view on renogen now looking forward because i know things are happening at that company it's one of the few really exciting opportunities on the JSE still at the moment. Yeah, as I'm looking right now, Mars Green, Renogen is down uh, 2% today to 31 Rand 25. Mm. Uh, it was quite hard. It hit overnight in Australia, down 5% in quite hefty volume. But the market for Renogen is now predominantly in this country and the Austra Australian trade has, uh, has slackened quite significantly. Now that reserve and resource that I was talking about over a year ago actually did come out. I think it was uh, mid-October last year. Uh, a very well-known international company out of Canada called Spool, uh, which for those that uh, understand the oil and gas sector, the two major global names uh, in, uh, in energy in terms of con uh, consulting is Spool and Wood Mackenzie. Mm. Uh, they are the benchmark go-tos. And Spool came out with, a, with an extremely bullish um, reserve and resource estimates called P1, P2, and P3, uh, which saw the Renogen share price literally take off like a rocket because they confirmed what uh, management had been uh, bleating on for quite some time, the underlying resource in the free state uh, containing methane, and as such, its subderivatives of, of helium were of world-class proportion. And that was the news the market had been waiting for, because at that point, Renogen was, well, you know, it was management telling us X, but we actually want an independent consultant to say it's actually Y, and it's true. And they came out with that scenario and the share price literally took off. Um, so that was October last year. I selected Renogen again, beginning of this year in one of my, in one of my top portfolios. And it went from about 31 Rand to about 40 something, remember, about 43. And we're now back to about 31.25. The key thing the market was waiting for this year was when would the commerciality of the Virginia phase one project actually start? There had been delays due to COVID, you know, actually shipping uh, equipment from China, as we all know, uh, has been difficult. There's been delays in getting equipment through, through to the ports. And there was a bit of a, uh, what I would call a log jam. Uh, the market was getting a little bit impatient regarding when Renogen would actually, what I would call, turn the taps. And the taps were due to be turned in late April, early May, and that got delayed. They were actually turned on uh, in late July. So a couple of months late, uh, that combined with, of course, what we've seen in the last uh, few months 
regarding the volatility in global markets uh, following the Russian and Ukraine situation is that many what I would call special situation stocks have started to slightly weaken. Now, interestingly, Renogen is, an, is a very, very uh, good case study. I was thinking this morning ahead of our conversation that Renogen is one of those wonderful stocks where there are extreme tribes covering the stock. Mm. There's a tribe like myself, you know, the professional institutional analyst who actually goes to kick the tires, speak to management consistently and understands the nuances of how what was initially an exploration company moves into commerciality. You then have the institutions coming on board, perhaps a bit later, as they don't like the risk and they'd rather wait for the company to start making money before investing. But then the easy money has gone. You then what, I, what, I, what you have uh, is what I would call the, the private client market, who gets in early and who, who, are, who love the stock. They are, they are devotees. Uh, and whatever you say, they just lap up and they don't really care what goes on in the short term because they're bought for the long term story. Then there's a last tribe, which is the, the, the most interesting one, where they got in a little bit too late. Uh, they've seen the share price run up from maybe the high 20s to the early 30s or early 40s. The share price is now down and they're bleating that the company is not moving fast enough. Uh, it's not doing enough to promote itself. Uh, and perhaps they're losing some money. And I want to say, well, those people shouldn't have bought the stock in the first place, because when you buy any form of special situation, specifically in energy, there is an element of risk. And Renogen to me remains a, a great long-term story. But as I've always said, nothing goes up in a straight line. Virginia phase one is now producing. The first LNG has been uh, tanked. I will go off to Ital Tile, the first customer uh, imminently, with Consul Glass being the second customer uh, in November. Uh, helium will then be produced and then sold. And then by 2026, Virginia phase two, which is an enormous expansion from the current uh, prospect. It's about 12 times larger, will come on stream. And then two or three years after that, so we're now talking in the late 20s, uh, this company will start to generate significant amounts of profits and cash flow uh, with its annual operating cost of only around 800 million rand a year. So I'm buying this stock not, not for a quick five minute punt. I'm buying it because in about five or eight years time, this company will be rapidly repaying debt. We'll be spewing out cash flow. And with very low underlying OPEX costs, they'll start paying extremely good dividends. And the prospect has a lifespan, probably 15 or 20 years. So that's the story that I like to project on Renogen. And whilst many in the market may want a more aggressive short-term story, again, short-term stories come and go. I like to back long-term winners. Mm, okay, fascinating. Something you said there that I, it's caught my my ear, um, you know, you said you're buying it with a five to eight year view and you think that this business has got a lifespan of you know, 15 to 20 years, given the reserves and so on. Now, something that's continually happening on the JSE, and we spoke about it last year, but it continues to happen, is that we're seeing good companies being bought out on the JSE. Just ones that are good, they're not attracting the right sort of market valuation Um and, and, and you're seeing them being taken out. And we could talk about these in a, in a while, but I mean, MassMart is one right now that springs to mind. But I want to just stick with Renogen for the moment. I mean, if you're seeing what you're seeing there and this good news story, surely this is also a company that becomes a buyout target for a big international player in the in the gas business at some point. Um, that's actually an extremely good question. And I've, and I've pondered on this for quite some time and I've spoken at length to the company about the potential permutations going forward. You know, my job as an analyst, having been an asset manager, uh, a corporate broker, and uh, uh, an equity salesman, is to always play the permutation game. You know, how can you make money? You can make money not just investing in the share, but perhaps looking for M&A opportunities. Mm. In Renegian's case, they have got uh, many years ahead of them of significant, significant capital investments to get Virginia Phase 2 up and running. They will then be one of the world's leading players in helium, and with a very large supply of liquid natural gas in this country, which will go into a combination of um, uh, energy sources to manufacturing, potentially LNG fuel into a trucking sector. And there's even talk about uh, a power plant, a peak cycle power plant being built on the Renogen site to supply the national grid. Uh, that's the scale of a deposit that they have there. Yeah. And there's even a greater scale where a contiguous block uh, of gas under the name of Rhino at some point could perhaps be melded into the Energen uh, field. So this is going to be a, a big, evolving, long-term play. Now, if the market 
for whatever reason becomes you know delusioned uh, with the progress of the company. You know, because you and I both know that substantial investments, particularly in what I would call resource-based uh, companies, tend to take years, if not a decade, to actually evolve into a profitable entity. Mm. Uh, just as a, just as a side adjunct, uh, the huge oil well off the coast of Namibia, which HCI has a 10% stake in, uh, could cost between 70 to $80 billion to develop and take north of 10 years. So we, we know the timelines. In Renegen's case, if the market suddenly gets disillusioned, and the share price starts to sort of languish, I would not be surprised if one of the major energy companies seeing the potential and the fact that the infrastructure has been proven, the resource in the ground has also been proven, suddenly says, you know what? Uh, there's currently a shortage globally of helium. LNG is, a, is in demand uh, in, in, in many jurisdictions, but this country needs energy given that ESCOM is falling down the toilet. Mm. Uh, it would not surprise me if somebody comes in to take on, to take on the company. But the caveat would that be is that is the Central Energy Fund has now taken a 10% stake in the LNG business. And given that energy in this country is a what I would call a national interest, one would have to ask, would the government allow a foreign entity to come in to actually buy someone like Renogen? Perhaps they'd have to partner with somebody to, to do the deal. But it's not outside the realms of possibility that in the years to come, if the market becomes uh, you know, delusioned uh, with Renogen, but a major international player seeing uh, what is actually in the ground, what is proven, takes the company out and it will not be at 31 Rand 25. Mm. Oh, no, it shouldn't be. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Brilliant insights as always. Another one of your uh, your favorites over the years has been Invicta. It's a company that supplies, as you've called it, widgets in the past. It supplies all the bits and pieces for heavy machinery. Um, you've liked this company for a long time. It's a Christo Visa stock. Um, but it's also one of these shares that's gone sideways for 18 months now. So, I mean, where do you stand on that now? Is this simply a, a, a healthy consolidation in time or correction in time that we're seeing on Invicta? Or is it, you know, is the company now a victim of the weak economic environment in South Africa and just falling into that value trap category? Um, the Invicta is a, fa- is a fascinating uh, case point. Uh, this company in its zenith was trading north of 100 rand. And then it did a combination of some stupid transactions and and some very um, unusual financial uh, restructurings. And the share price basically fell in a heap. Mm. You could have bought the stock at the height of a COVID sell-off in March 2020 at a lower three rand. Uh, It then soared to a higher 35 rand, which was my target price. When I tipped the company at six bucks uh, back in April 2020. And we're now back to about 25 rand. And it's it's been trending sideways for a matter of months. And I'm going to be as bold to say that this is one of the stocks that I have on my radar for the last few months as the stock that will probably pop. And then the market will say, oh, where did that come from? We didn't see that coming. And it's the, the underlying value trap on Invicta is written all over it in black and white. It's got signs on it. It's got neon lights flashing. The market, <laughs> the market is completely ignoring it. Stephen Joffrey, the CEO, has performed a Herculean task in the last two and a half years transforming this company from a debt-ridden company with a massive SARS tax bill to one which is now debt-free and actually quite profitable. But you're right, it is stuck in that uh, scenario of it's the domestic company, all be with a growing offshore earnings and revenue component that is perceived to be you know, stuck in the mud because of the, the weak economic situation here in South Africa. But at 25 rand, Um, It's a September interim results period. I wouldn't be surprised if something comes out in the next week or two regarding some form of uh, interim trading update. It's a March year end. Uh, My forecast number this year is about four rand to four rand ten. And if I'm right, and it's a big if because no one's ever right, that puts a stock in a P of six times. Mm -hmm. The net asset value of this company is about 38 rand. So as it stands right now, the discount net asset value is around 34% for a stock which has historically traded at a premium to net asset value. So what do I think is going to happen? I think the company is going to come out with a pretty good interim and final year update. They're going to show the market that the overseas earnings are growing quite nicely, thank you, because no one quite understands what they did to restructure their Singaporean and Chinese assets. Uh, The UK business they bought at the start of this year is performing very nicely, thank you, despite what Liz Truss is doing to the UK economy. And I think Invicta, to me, is one of those classic stocks, market value about two, two and a half billion rand, 
tightly held by a handful of institutions. You know, insiders and Crystal Visa are large shareholders, and it's just illiquid. And because I think very few people actually cover it, there's probably only one, if not two, analysts who cover the shares. Um, it, it just goes, it goes unnoticed. I've highlighted this stock for the last few months. And again, I'm not one for making bold uh, calls, uh, but I would stick my neck out and saying, oh, Invicto to me uh, is one of those stocks that I think is going to, at some point, catch the market's eye and is going to take off. Yeah. My current target price is 35 Rand, and I think I could be easily attained, when after that, 38 Rand and then 45. Uh, so I would say, if, you, if we come back in a year's time, hopefully, watch this space. Okay. Yeah. Super. Can I hold you to that then? I mean, is, is that going to be the Grinrod of this interview? Last year, <laughs> Grinrod was your pick. Um, you know, we, shall we? Shall I hold you to that? Would that be your pick of the interview? You're listening to Talking with Traders, a podcast series brought to you by IG, a world leading online trading and investment provider. If you haven't checked out the IG online trading platform, please do so and visit IG.com. Also, make sure you subscribe to the podcast series on your favorite podcast app or website by clicking on the subscribe button and you'll be notified weekly as we release new episodes. Well, I've, I've, actually, got, I've actually got another one. All but, right. Uh, the, other, the other one would be Kura Holdings. Uh, Kura mm-hmm. Holdings, uh, the school and education company, which again has completely fallen off a wagon. Uh, the share price at its peak in 2015 was 60 rand. Uh, it fell to 4 rand 62 at the height of a COVID sell-off. Mm. We're now back to 8 rand 78, um, having been off its recent best of around 12, 13 rand, purely because of the PSG unbundling. Uh, for those uh, listeners who know what's been going on in the JSC, PSG Group, the vaunted investment vehicle founded by the legendary Yanni Bouton, uh, has decided to delist itself and unbundle pretty much all of its assets. Yeah. And they let go 64% of Kuro, which has depressed the share price because a massive liquidity event has seen portfolios flooded with, with education companies. So at 8 Rand 78, as it stands right now, if I had to choose between Invicta and, uh, and Kuro as to which stock I think would do best on a 12-month view, I would probably uh, pick Kuro. I have a target price on the company of 16 Rand. And that's going to be an article published as of this week in the Financial Mail. I've written a a special feature on education companies, completely changing my ranking. So my upside target in Kuro is 82%. So I would say between Invicta and Kuro, those are my two go-to stocks for the next 12 months. Okay. All right. Sure. That's okay. Super. Well, let's watch those. When I, when I speak to you in a year's time, um, hopefully you give me the time again, as you've done in the past, I'd love to catch up again. We can talk about those two and see, and as I said, Grinrod was your pick last year and it's up a hundred percent since we spoke last time. So you've got a, it's a tough act to follow, but Kuro with a, with a price target more than 80% above the current level sounds good. Um, Something else, Anthony, is and it's coming back to this theme of buyouts. We've we've mentioned it a little bit, but I mean, a lot of the stocks that you talked about there, like Invicta, it's so cheap. It's a six times PE. Um, you know, it trades at a huge discount to net asset value. It is illiquid, though. That's the problem. And I know a lot of the stocks that are in your universe are relatively illiquid because they're they're in the small and mid cap space, and that's not typically an area where the the really big funds will always be playing, simply because the the, the stocks are just too illiquid. Um, it's it's kind of I don't know what what to say, but you know, the JSE, just generally speaking, to me, it's almost become. Now, it may sound nasty or wrong to say this, but it feels like a flea market sometimes where, you know, you go to a flea market, you're not going to buy a Rolex watch at a flea market. And if you try and sell a Rolex watch at the flea market, you're not going to get what the thing is worth. You need to go to a high end store in a shopping mall to sell that in, in order to get the value for what that thing is actually worth. The JSE has some very, very good companies listed on it, on it like the ones that you've mentioned here. But they just don't seem to be attracting the kind of valuations that they really should deserve. And I guess it's a function of a some of these companies are a bit illiquid, like we've said, they're a bit small, maybe. Um, but it's also, I think, possibly a, a case that a lot of the foreign involvement in the JSC has simply vanished. And for that reason, 
there's just not the the appetite, not the interest that there used to be to try and give these companies the kind of valuations that they deserve. And as a result of that, we're seeing more and more companies, good companies, the the Rolexes of the JSE, let's call them that, being taken out. Distel is is still um, involved in a deal with Heineken and will leave the JSE soon. Massmart, uh, Walmart have announced recently they're coming in to take out the rest of Massmart that they don't already own. Grinrod Shipping is another one. MediClinic is about to leave the exchange soon. Um, there's talk of a, of a deal now with Telcom, potentially with either Rain or MTN. That one might leave the exchange. And multi-choice is another one. I know that Canal Plus has been buying and buying in the market for a long time. One sense is that at some point that also could potentially be a stock that leaves the JSE. I mean, it's it's a great pity. And before this interview, you and I were talking, you said, you know, we're down to about 220 companies on the JSE now, whereas there were more than 800, uh, you know, just over a decade ago. It's a great pity to see this, but I mean, what do we do about this? And how do we how do we get these companies to attract that kind of valuation, the, the kind of valuations that they should really deserve in, in another way, that which is not taking them off the exchange and putting them into private ownership? Yeah, you know, markets constantly evolve. You know, you and I have been around for quite a long time, perhaps me a little bit longer than you. And I can remember many of these market cycles coming and going. When I first started covering the JSC small cap sector in the early 90s, uh, the average PE for a stock back then was probably in the mid to high teens. Mm. Uh, it, it fell to a low during the COVID period. Uh, I could buy fantastic, well-run, solid, long-term family-owned businesses for P's of twos and threes. And right now, they're probably back to maybe on average of five or a six if you're lucky. Now, if you think of it on the, uh, on the flip side, if you were an unlisted family business or an entrepreneur who's founded a very good company in this country, why the hell would you want to list your company on the, on the domestic stock exchange when one, you would not get the valuation that you think you deserve, given all the blood, sweat and tears you've done to build this company? Secondly, private equity tends to pay significantly better premiums to buy out good businesses because they have a much longer term time horizon in terms of return on capital and return on investment. Whereas a stock market has what I call quarter-itis. They want constantly performing uh, companies giving you out quarterly or half yearly numbers. So I can see uh, reasonably why companies do not want to list on the JSE. Regarding the buyouts, again, we go in phases. You know, right now we've had a period of, as you know, free money, where globally, it, the amount of free money sloshing around the system uh, So buyouts, you know, happen on a consistent basis. We're now in an interest rate tightening environment. So perhaps the buyouts will not be as uh, aggressive as it was when interest rates were basically zero. Mm -hmm. But again, on the domestic JSE, when you can buy really solid businesses with fairly good franchises and great track records, again, and you can buy them out on, on low single digit PEs, it's going to be a consistent theme in this market until greater interest actually occurs. But I actually don't see that happening. As the market starts to dwindle, and we now become one of these, what I would call, uh, You've got, two, you've got two different markets. You've got the Santon Cities, for those that know what Santon City is, the, the premier shopping center where all the big blue chips are listed. You know, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, SA, the SA breweries of the day, uh, BAT, American Tobacco, BHP Bulletin, Anglo-American, Naspers, et cetera, et cetera, which attract most of the international attention. So the international players only want to go into the, the, you know, the top 10 or 20 large liquid international plays. Then you've got, as you said earlier, the flea market, where there's some really good little companies. And occasionally you do find that little brooch, which looks like a piece of glass, but it's actually a diamond. But you have to, be a, you have, to have a very good eye in order to spot it. The trouble is people do not have the time to spend perusing through the small to mid cap space, which is why analysts like myself you know, still have a job. Institutions are so preoccupied with investing in large liquid counters. But when a buyout comes, they generally take the money and run. I cannot recall in near memory institutions in this country fighting back and saying, you know what, we think this deal is undervalued. We're not taking this money, uh, you know, come back for more. They generally do squeeze a bit more out of them, but very few deals actually are, are, are canned because the institutions say we are not taking the money. And this deal is a classic case and example. At 180 Rand, it is an unmitigated steal. 
uh, and that one of the champions in this country is being snappled up by Heineken. And then in, in a few years time, we will, we will wonder why that actually occurred. So there's no real answer to your question. I don't see any new listings actually occurring of any materiality. I see buyouts continuing, and I see a greater concentration towards the, the, large, the large offshore stocks, because that's the way that the world is going, sadly, uh, which leaves the, the small to mid-cap domestic market uh, at the mercy of either specialist fund managers who are doing very nicely, thank you, and the private client sector. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just makes one question the viability of these other stock exchanges that are coming on. I mean, I know we've got the others. That, um, what's, the, what's the other one called? Czar? Uh, no, ZRX has gone bust. Czar X, uh, the, okay. Yeah, the Cape Town Stock Exchange it, is actually attracting some very interesting listings, but it's very niche. Uh, they're doing, they're doing debt, debt structures for, for corporates, and they've listed some very interesting companies. Excuse me. Um, They've got a very nice little niche in agriculture and what I would call alternative investments. So it's small, but at the end of the day, because it's a digital platform, uh, their, their costs of listing are a fraction of what the JSE would charge. And they are what I would call, you know, they have a much lighter touch because they attract smaller companies. And let's not forget that sometimes you list in a smaller exchange and then you migrate to the JSE. So a recent listing called CANS which is an African um, consumer goods company, moved from the Cape Town Stock Exchange to the JSE because mm. they've gotten large. So sometimes little companies on small exchanges become slightly bigger companies on a bigger exchange. Yeah, and that, that I think if I'm not wrong, I think that's the only new listing that's been that's come yep. to the JSE this year, isn't it? That yep. company. and that was a move from the Cape Town Stock Exchange. Yeah, yeah, so it's like an incubator. Do you cover the shares, or do you cover the JSE Limited at all in your research or not? Um, well, the answer is not really. Um, I suppose I actually should, um, give, given it is now you know a, a, a mid cap and it's a, you know monopolies normally do quite well. But the trouble is you know a, a, a monopoly in what I what I see as a as a dying market. Mm. Um, you know the only way they can keep on actually making money is either cutting costs or putting up fees, which isn't exactly a great place to want to invest in. Where the only way you make you make money is either charging more for less. For, for less product or, 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 or basically just cutting cutting overhead. So the answer is I don't cover the JSE. Um, perhaps at some point I would, but you know, there is there is an exclusion, which means you actually can't take over the JSE. It's basically bid proof. Uh, Yanni Mouton tried many years ago and he successfully restructured the company leading it to its demutualization. But I actually don't think the JSE, unless I'm completely incorrect, can be taken over. I think the regulator would have a field day, but saying that, uh, why would why would an international boss like the London Stock Exchange or the New York Stock Exchange or any of the global bosses want to take over the JSE? Um, you know, I, I often tell people when I first started covering the Johannesburg Stock Exchange back in 1994, when I was working for a French investment bank in London, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the eve of democracy in this country in April, the JSE back then was the 10th largest stock market in the world. People forget that. Now we're a, we're a pipsqueak on the arse end of Africa and nobody cares. Mm. Yeah, it's a great pity. And hence why we get these you know, companies that are so deeply undervalued listed on the JSC. It's a, it's a pity. It's a, it is sad. I mean, you know, my, my time in the market has been, what, 20, 21 years now. And it's quite noticeable to see what, it's, what, it's, what it was when I started my career relative to what it is now. And I mean, lots of us are just really being forced to look elsewhere, look overseas for trading opportunities because it's just, there's not enough on the JSE, unfortunately. Um, Anthony, last year when we spoke, you mentioned that you were thinking of setting up a website to uh, publish your research and it would be a subscription website. Have you managed to make any progress in that respect? Um, the answer simply is no. So I own the website. I own all the legal domains and the trademarks uh, to my name and Small Talk Daily. But such is the nature of my life. If anybody could see a snapshot of my office right now at home, uh, with a dog sleeping behind my chair, <laughs> and 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 I, I'm an I'm an old uh, uh, um, uh, Brit, so I don't work on meters and centimeters. I work on feet and inches. So I've got feet and feet of piles of files around the floor and on my desk. It's reporting season. And I often get bog, uh, uh, bogged down in, 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 the, in the thing that I love doing, which is basically analyzing and writing about companies. Um, what I know about technology, you could write on the back of a very small stamp. 
<laughs> so I've yet to find anybody who can actually take the vision of what's in my head and put it on a, on a, on a digital platform to enable me to actually to articulate what I want to say. So I wanted to create like the Instagram of small to mid cap markets with a, with a constantly updated uh, narrative. And I haven't done that yet. I have partnered with a few um, online sites like uh, FinMeUp and uh, mm. a couple of other players where yes. my content is available to private clients on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a basis, but I do not have my own website as of yet. At some point, perhaps I will. So if someone's a really good web developer and they can take what's inside my head uh, and put it on paper in full color, perhaps they should drop me a line. Okay. Well, there's an opportunity for somebody who's up to the, op- up, up to the task. Could be a very interesting exercise. As I always do with these interviews, Anthony, I like to also just take it a little bit away from the markets and trading and investing and uh, you know talk about some soft stuff as well, just to get to know the guest a little bit more besides the the hard numbers and what you do in the, in terms of your career. Last year, I spoke to you about your your green beast, the Land Rover, which I still think is absolutely exquisite. This year, I want to ask you something different. You're going to be turning 55 years old on the 28th of October. And yet, those who could could see you, and it, I mean, you, there's plenty of um, videos of you out there on the internet, will know that you look not a day older than 40. You're in great shape. You hit the gym a lot. Um, you're in better shape than many 25-year-olds, I think. What's the secret? What's the secret to your longevity? Well, firstly, I, did, I didn't pay you to say that, so thank you for your kindness. <laughs> um, interestingly, as I, as I said to you before in, in this interview, you, you are shaped by who you are. Uh, growing up as a child and you know having come from a from a very uh, as I said you know a, a working class council house broken home background you were driven to work hard and to succeed part of that comes with the fact that you know you want to escape your environment uh, I was back in the UK uh, a month and a half ago to see my father who's still working on his farm and he's 78 years old and to look at him you would not say he's 78 because he's still working the farm by himself was a dairy and a sheep farmer in, in deepest, darkest rural Wales. And he's worked hard his entire life. Uh, I look at my mother, who's now sadly passed away. And uh, most of my family, uh, excluding my dad, were in very poor health. Again, a combination of, a, of their background and circumstances. And I vowed many years ago, but I've got too much to do. And I, and I actually love what I do in, in, the, in the markets, working for myself now. And to look after myself, to try and keep in as in a good a shape as I can. Granted, you never know what uh, what the Almighty you know sends your way regarding illnesses and disease. But uh, having seen my family pass away from a combination of what I would call easily preventable diseases, I vow to look after myself. So I have a reasonably good diet. Uh, I escape the house every single day uh, to go and see my personal trainer for an hour, because if I didn't, I'd never leave the house. Uh, anyone that knows me knows that I, I'm. I, I love my work. I'm changed my PC, but I do it willingly. So just to escape, I go and see my trainer and I do it to recharge and just switch off for an hour. And I think it's a combination of, of that, uh, a good work ethic coming from my dad, uh, the genetics of my mother, who was a, who was a beauty even when she died uh, of breast cancer at 68. And I'll be very honest, a little bit of Botox. I'm 55. I'm certainly not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one does one does what one needs to do to keep going. But I think a lot of it comes down to the energy that you have as a person. You know, you, I've met some people who are young, but they look old because they have a, they have a negative attitude to life. Whereas I have this upbeat. You know, there's always a silver lining. Things will always get better. The glass is half full, not half empty. And I think that very energy is it, it's something that just percolates through, through you and resonates, even in the work that you do on the, or in the persona that you give out to people. So I would think a lot, a lot of, uh, of, my, of, my, uh, of, of, my, of my natural, let's call it youth, comes from the fact that I'm generally a very energetic, upbeat person. And I don't think that will ever change, whether I'm 55, 65, 75, or 105. I have no plans to ever stop working. I should be like Warren Buffett. You'll have to wheel me out in a chair. <laughs> well, Anthony, your passion, your enthusiasm, your energy is is always palpable. And I always enjoy speaking to you. And as always, this, this interview has been fantastic. I've thoroughly enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you for your time, as always. I appreciate it. and. Um, 
yeah, for listeners, the tricks for this interview, we, we looked at Kuro Holdings with a much higher target price than current levels. And also Invicta looks as if it could pop higher at some point. So Anthony, we, we'll chat again, perhaps in another year when you're almost 56 and still uh, looking fantastic, still chiseled and still energetic and passionate about your work. Thanks, Goff. Take care. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Talking With Traders, brought to you by IG, a world-leading CFD provider. We really are privileged to have such a leader in the field of online trading involved in this series. Please follow us on Facebook and engage with us there. And a reminder to make sure you subscribe to this series by clicking on the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we'd also appreciate if you'd leave a review on the app too. Till next time.